Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the talk show, episode number eight, four and four. Equal balance, and we have just the right guest today to speak to us about mind body balance, all the way from、uh, raised in Kentucky. His name is Mick Goodman, also known as Ram, which we will go into much more、uh, in detail in this conversation. So, first of all, a brief introduction.、Um, but I would like to also welcome him to、uh, on the show.、Uh, thanks for spending some time to share with us today, Mr. Ram. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ram was actually、uh, raised as a Baptist in Kentucky, in America,、uh, having grown up in, in、uh, several Western mystery traditions,、um, which we will expound about later. He moved into yoga. And in the nineties, he also took initiation into a particular branch of Hinduism, known as Advaita Vedanta. And Ram is also known to be a mental health survivor, and will be sharing with us tips today on how we can cope with the stresses of life. So, thank you once again. Welcome. And would you like to share with us,、uh, you know, to elaborate a bit more about、uh, a bit of your biography and who you are? Okay. Yes. Um, yes, I grew up in Kentucky and、uh, live in Kansas City now. But、um, I grew up in Kentucky, and、um, actually, my parents were Baptist. But my、um, my father had my grandfather was a preacher, so my my father had religion very much forced upon him. So he was very open about how we、uh, embraced our spiritual paths. And my older brother was a theosophist. If you're familiar with the school of theosophy, Madame Blavatsky, and so that was a lot of my influence growing up. In fact, when I was 12 years old, I my brother had read the story of、uh, Siddhartha to me, of the Buddha, and、um, I、uh, I fell in love with the story and decided I was Buddhist, and <laughs>、uh, but really didn't know much about Buddhism at the time. So I kind of grew up with this、uh, understanding of、uh, even yoga, and as a teenager, I even did some yoga.、Um, Following along with books mostly, and、um, as I got older, I became involved in martial arts,、um, mostly、um, Jido Kwan, Shotokan, and、uh, Shaolin, and in the meditation practices that went with that. And then,、uh, as I got older, I gradually moved more into yoga. And so, nineteen ninety four, I took training in Sampurna Yoga. At Yogi Hari's ashram in Florida, and、um, then later on Ashtanga Yoga training with David Swenson, and then again teacher advanced teacher training with Yogi Hari. But my initiation and the name Ram were given to me by Bharat Gajar, who、um, was a,、um, a Hindu priest and、uh, ran a Shivananda Yoga Vedanta Center in Wilmington, Delaware. At the time, I was living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and it was a little bit of a drive, but well worth it that I would go and visit there. And I had looked him up intentionally. I was actually looking for a conversion process to Hinduism, which、uh, most most of the、uh, various schools of Hindu thought don't necessarily have one.、Um, I know the Arya Samaj does, and I think there's another organization, but.、Um, um, Receiving a name was part of that for me. So the process was、uh, that I I went to visit、uh, Yogi Bharat and he performed a puja and a naming ceremony, and then we followed that up with a fire ceremony. Then he had another priest come in and perform, and quite quite beautiful, and had a significant impact on me.、Um, and so I pursued that path for quite a while. I'd actually had three different、um, traditional initiations because I didn't really know what was going on initially. I was attending a Hindu temple in the early '90s in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I met a Swamini Krishnakanta, and、um, she invited me over and initiated me. And it was like I didn't even know this was going to happen. I guess everybody else around me understood what was taking place, but I didn't. So when it came around the second time, which was、um, When I did the teacher training at Yogi Hari's, I was apprehensive because I didn't understand it the first time. But、um, 
He insisted it was a blessing, so I went ahead. But then with Yogi Bhatt, it, it was an intentional seeking out to, to connect and, um, and probably more of an identity thing more than anything, um, feeling the need to connect in that way, which in some ways I feel like I've moved beyond that. But, um, you know, still this, this personality that's who I am, um, these experiences and, and uh, what I've been through. So, but my practice is leaning more and more toward Vedanta than yoga. So part of that being the body aging as well. Uh, turned 65 this next year and um, uh, also dealing with an autoimmune condition. So um, yeah, feeling it more and more, but I'm still teaching. I teach a regular class uh, Monday through Friday mornings, a uh, regular asana class with some pranayama, but um, uh, my, my main focus really is meditation and uh, Advaita. Very beautiful. Um... You know, you just mentioned that you being 65, but you look more 20 years your junior. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. And you some know, days this, I feel it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you know, these are some of the benefits, you know, for, for, for the practice of what you have been practicing with Hatha Yoga, with the meditations from the various traditions you've been in as well. You know, so anyone mm -hmm. who's watching, um, you know, there are a lot of, uh, physical and mental and spiritual health benefits with the practice of yoga, with the practice mm -hmm. of a certain form of a traditional spirituality as well, mm -hmm. uh, especially if we integrate it correctly. So um, you've mentioned a lot of things, um, very interesting coming from a, a very religious background uh, with a Baptist and then slowly with some influence um, with your brother and also with your personal self-inquiry. Um, you know, with theosophy, with um, with a little bit of Buddhism and then into yoga in the 90s and whatnot. So, you know, you have lived through um, what was a very interesting period of time, you know, when a lot of the Eastern forms of spiritualities were transmitted or were introduced into the West. You know, not many mm -hmm. people these days grew up in this era. So, I mean, you can say, you know, during the colonial period, there was a lot of sociologists and anthropologists who were trying to make, make understand what was happening with India and the systems. You know, this was around the time of Vivekananda, uh, who mm -hmm. was introduced into the West in the late 1800s. And then you also had Mahatma Gandhi as well, you know, uh, promoting Ahimsa you know, non-violence and all that seeped through worldwide as well. So you had these periods of time, but you also had the period of time um, around, uh, I think in the US, it was around the Vietnam War. So around the 70s, the hippie, the hippie revolution, which took, which took place. And a lot of people um, disenchanted with the way of life in the West or in America, in the, in, in the UK and other parts of the Europe made their way towards, uh, you know, to, to find this, uh, this Eastern paradise, you know, the Shambhala, the Shangri-La, um, whether they were interested in, in Buddhism, whether they were interested in Taoism, in Hinduism, or even everything. And a lot of them actually were initiated in some of, uh, under some of these teachers. And a lot of these teachers also started traveling and setting up camp, setting up organizations, schools, and all that in the West. And you are have grown up in this golden generation, which is very, mm -hmm. very rare now for practitioners to experience such a shift. So, you know, very blessed that you have a center around you or at least in a state or in a town near you or even neighboring mm -hmm. states. And you mentioned you traveled to Ohio, to various mm -hmm. parts also for Florida as well for various trainings. So, um, yeah, so, so in order to, to carry on into this uh, sharing and discussion, I'm very curious um, how is, it has impacted you coming from a very different background uh, socially, uh, religiously, uh, culturally, you know, um, being an American in the West. With Eastern traditions, you know, I mean, there are many questions I can ask here which you can touch upon, you know, did it feel familiar? Did it take time to integrate, you know, all these things? And um, also maybe share how people close to you uh, perceived it, you know, how you felt mm -hmm. uh, to be comfortable with it. 
you know. So, mm-hmm. would you like to share with us a bit more about? This? Certainly, certainly. Um, actually, and there have been a few things in my life that have been so familiar that they were instantly comfortable. But especially um, the first time I walked into a karate class, <laughs> um, it was it was very familiar. It was like I I've, I've been here before, and um, um, with going to the Hindu temple, it. Um, I've always been comfortable with it. And people have commented on that uh, to me. Um, in fact, recently, one friend was saying, he said, he says, what I like about you. He said, this is no different for you than anywhere else. And it isn't. I mean, I feel like I fit right in. Um, in fact, I feel, especially in the Vedanta study groups that I was going to with Chimaya Mission, which is connected to the same lineage as the Shivananda yoga. So, and, um, uh, always felt very connected. It always felt um, very familiar. I, I wasn't uncomfortable. I know that there was one situation when I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, that there was one person who would, who would give me these looks and I asked a friend about it. And he said, oh, he thinks the Westerners are here to steal our gods. And told me not to worry about it. <laughs> but but that's, uh, that's the only time really... Um, um, Oh, one, one, one woman did ask me in the shoe room at the temple here a couple of years ago. She just looked up at me as I was leaving and she said, why are you here? <laughs> and uh, it, what seemed like kind of an awkward moment, actually, it got to be quite nice. I told her, you know, briefly my story and, and she appreciated it. In fact, the last time I saw her was um, when I got back from India because I told her I was going to go to India and, and, and told her about it. So, it's been mostly pretty accepting. Um, I find that most of the, like the temple here, larger temples are not, um, you know, they're pretty well already established communities and they're not really as much about, um, about Vedanta or philosophy, you know, they're Hindu temples. They're there for, for, for worship, for the pujas. And, um, so I find that Chimaya has, uh, has kind of fulfilled that role for me in the, in the meantime. Um, the temple that I went to in Cincinnati was very small. Um, and so it was a much smaller, closer group of people. Um, but no, mostly it's been very welcoming. Now my family, on the other hand, quite different. Um, uh, I've got, um, I have two brothers and a sister. I know one family member that doesn't accept uh, the path that I've taken at all. And then I've got another one that's upset with me about my name, (laughs) which doesn't matter to me. Um, But, you know, and, you know, I still love them, but sometimes you have to love people from a distance and, um, and be who you are. (laughs) So, um, and that's fine. Um, But yeah, that's basically been my experience as far as, acceptance goes i've not really had any issues with the people uh, in the temples accepting me or any of the um, vedanta study groups Um, no issues with that at all but occasionally an issue with with someone who sees that as being a, a a heathen path i guess you might say (laughs) Yeah, and, and you know, discrimination can uh, come in any 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 you know shape or form. You know, um, when I was in India the last time, also um, they rejected uh, one of my stays at the ashram because I didn't I couldn't I didn't speak Hindi. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you know, or if you are not from India, you know, because right, um, right. yeah, so it can I- happen. It happens also. <laughs> I, I would imagine that it, I would probably see that more in India. And that's, that's what I had heard too. And uh, was part of one of my reasons for wanting to, uh, because I thought I would get the chance to go back more often too, that I, I thought, well, I would like to go and visit temples. And my understanding is, is that sometimes there are temples that won't let you in if you don't have a Hindu name, um, legally a Hindu name. And, um, um, so that was part of the motivation in that too, is just 
you know, being able to go there and go where I wanted and, and, and just to feel a part of it as well. Yes, I would like to touch upon, um, you've mentioned about the initiations you went through. So like, mm -hmm. um, you know, in Indian traditions, and I'm sure in also in uh, various other schools as well, maybe in China and whatnot, you have the um, guru and disciple relationship, or at mm -hmm. least the initiation in that sense. So how has that empowered you? I mean, there are many practitioners out there in the world or people who are enthusiasts, uh, people who are interested in all the traditions. They self-learn mainly their whole life and they never really had this kind of experience or they shunned away from such experiences. So how, has, um, how would you say that this um, initiations and guru-disciple relationship has empowered your life um, as compared to, you know, buying a few books here and there and trying to pick up meditation on your own and whatnot? Well, I think mostly it's the, um, that especially at the time, it was the connecting to a lineage. Um, and, and now, especially that's more about the Vedanta than it was the yoga. Although the Shivananda school is both yoga, Vedanta, uh, um, but um, it was really the, about that being connected. I mean, you could compare it to shopping for a brand name, <laughs> you know, that you, you, uh, um, you know, if some stranger comes up to you and tells you he's gonna, he, can, he can teach you to find happiness and the secret to life or whatever, that uh, um, that's one thing. But if it's, a, if it's a lineage, if it's a tradition that's been passed down, it's a teaching that's been established, then that was, that was what interested me rather than, than, than little bits and pieces from different places, which is what, what happens a lot. And I, I don't want to say that there's anything wrong with that because I think it's really an individual matter. Um, and, you know, for some people, that's the way they may even need to transition from whatever tradition they may have grown up with, that they may have to kind of do this eclectic uh, blending of, of, of different things. But, um, but for me, it was, it was that connection with lineage and because it's the most, especially as, as it's presented in the, the text of uh, Adi Shankaracharya, it's just so direct and so precise, you know, um, you know, much more than this kind of uh, common lingo about just oneness, everything being one, it basically breaks it down and explains, explains the uh, human condition and suffering and how our sufferings are caused by, you know, how we're, we're, we are imprisoned by our minds and that, that um, we just let thoughts carry us away. And it was more about instilling that discipline and the initiation itself was, you know, mantra uh, initiation. So the practice of japa and the focusing of the mind and doing all this, which in Vedanta, um, these practices, even along with puja, which I really don't do much of, because I really can't do it correctly. <laughs> so um, uh, these practices are all considered um, chitta shuddhi, the purification of the mind uh, to prepare you for going beyond the mind to, to uh, an understanding that's beyond thought, beyond words. Yes, so you've mentioned about some people having to go through this eclectic blend, mm -hmm. of, you know, to try to find this identity or maybe they can resonate with, you know, certain remnants and elements of various traditions. And I think even both of us have been through somewhat experimentation at some point and many others mm -hmm. as well who are watching. Um, you've mentioned about Adi Shankara, who mm -hmm. is... Um, associated with Advaita Vedanta. Vedanta being one of the, as, as a lot of scholars agree, one of the six darshanas or schools within Hinduism. But of course, um, the other accounts saying that there are more and many different subcategories and so on. But we will, you know, stick to this model for here. So you have, you have, you have the Vedanta school and within that you have various branches as well. 
Yes. You have Advaita Vedanta. You have uh, you have Vicious Vata Advanta uh, Vedanta. You have the the dualist school as well, Advaita. Advaita. Mm-hmm. Advaita. So, would you like to explain a bit more about Advaita Vedanta to someone who is uh, not familiar with uh, this? Maybe what the meaning of the terms are, and maybe some of the the uniqueness of this tradition. Well, and you can you can look at this in a couple of different ways as far as being able to speak about it because again we're talking about the the nature of reality of of absolute reality which is beyond words. So the, any words we use to describe it are going to fall short. So we have to kind of make little allowances in speaking of it. Um, and you can speak of it in a couple of different ways. You could use a secular language or a religious language. To put it in the simplest terms, um, in, in a spiritual or religious language, I would say that Advaita says not only is there God, there is nothing but God. And um, to put it in, in more um, secular uh, terms, and, and these are the terms that are used in translating a lot too, in understanding um, this particular philosophy is that, that it, God is pure consciousness, that the nature of reality is, um, is pure consciousness and that what we experience here is merely an imposition, superimposition upon the screen of consciousness. And this is what we see as, as the world. Um, but there's kind of a first step and this is the one that actually I think is especially helpful in the mental health field kind of jumping ahead here, but, um, is the realization that I am not this body and especially I am not this mind. So, um, you're familiar with the koshas, of course. Pranamaya kosha, manamaya. So, yeah, manamaya kosha, the mind, and vigyana maya kosha, intellect, which is reasoning and judgment. And so, so you have this working aspect of the mind, and then you have this um, sort of invo- involuntary aspect, um, just like with your breathing. So, with the breathing, you can breathe intentionally, you can relax, and it happens by itself. Well, you can focus your attention and your thoughts and direct yourself in your works through the working mind. But then you also have these thoughts that just randomly float, pop up out of nowhere, seemingly. Um, and that, that's where it gets into trouble, especially when we start crossing over the, um, the methods that are used by the working mind of analyzing, judging, comparing, and all that starts carrying over into these other thoughts. And each of those thoughts has a little bit of the I-ness the me attached to it. And so it identifies with those thoughts. And so those thoughts are fairly random, but they're a lot of times they're self-criticisms or or criticisms of others and judgments and things that are really, in a lot of cases, totally unnecessary. I mean, using discernment and discrimination is one thing, but, you know, just this constant, you know, comparing and, and resisting the current situation, a resistance to what is at the present moment. It's always that, what if it was something else? <laughs> if only it was this, or if only this person behaved that way or this way. So um, anyway, with the practice of Vedanta, the study of this uh, philosophy, I think one of the most helpful things is coming to that understanding. And even if it's just an, an initially an understanding, a belief, um, it, it's one that's helpful. It's one that can be practical when those thoughts come up, you know, even if you don't have this full realization of yourself as an entity separate from the body and mind. So it serves as support in that way until there's some level of um, recognition that makes it more of a conviction than just a belief. Yes, you've mentioned about the different koshas, different layers you know, whether it's mm-hmm. Anamaya all the way to Vijana Kosha. Mm-hmm. And it also reminded me of some of the uh, teachings in uh, Buddhism where you have the skandhas or the aggregates. 
you know, whether it's oh, uh, yes. mm. body, sensation, discrimination, compositional factors, and mind or consciousness. So, mm. you know, it's uh, part of this, um, it's part of the uniqueness of some of these Indian traditions. In, mm-hmm. in, in the Hindu schools, in the Buddhist schools, in even in Jainism, uh, some of the Sikh traditions as well, um, Shramana movements as well, you have this kind of um, contemplative science. You know, it's like a, it's a contemplative tradition, self-inquiry mm-hmm. traditions, not mm-hmm. just knowledge philosophically, but in wisdom integrally as well. It's a way of mm-hmm. life. So, you know, the, the, the richness of the Indian philosophy, um, you know, was aimed towards the, um, towards this liberation, you know, towards overcoming suffering. You know, most of the schools were looking towards this form of emancipation, if I might, might put it that way, whether you want to call it nirvana, moksha, mm-hmm. and many, mm-hmm. many different terms, and also many different sub terms within those categories. So that's something which is, um, you know, not as expounded upon as much in Western philosophy or the upbringing in the modern world. You know, it's not really emphasized upon. Um, and I think um, especially in, um, in, in Hinduism as well, in some, of the, in some of the classical texts, it's mentioned about the different stages or the different, uh, you know, of life. Um, mm-hmm. So that, you know, that a- a- anyone or everyone can practice according to uh, the various capacities, you know, uh, the various, uh, maybe their situational uh, habitats or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So um, what are some things um, you've mentioned, you touched a bit on mental health, but what are some things um, in your current situation, um, you know, living in America, um, having the job you had and teaching yoga, and what, what are some of the practices which can be integrated on a day-to-day basis or you have integrated over the years, which can be very beneficial at the workplace, very beneficial when dealing with, uh, with family members, with different challenges, with um, normal day? Well, it's, it's been um, an ever-changing situation. And to, if you don't mind, to fully put it in perspective. Um, so like I, like I'd mentioned with the bio before about two different stories. So, you know, it's like, there's me as the seeker that has gone through all this. There's this parallel story as a sufferer, <laughs> as uh, a samsari, I guess, <laughs> um, where um, I, you know, I'd attempted suicide when I was 17 and, um, I was often on medications and this, and then I was okay for a number of years without anything. And then was teaching yoga actually quite, quite regularly and had studied some of this philosophy, but it had not really taken root, so to speak. <laughs> it wasn't a conviction, as I said. So um, um, I, you know, basically had, you can, I think I used to call having a breakdown and, um, but went through a series of, uh, of episodes of mania and depression, especially extreme depression. And um, ultimately ended up uh, on multiple medications and having to have electroconvulsive therapy over a period of six months. So that was quite dramatic. And um, I, this happened in 2008 is when I had the treatments. And it all started a couple of years before that um, right after my mother's death. And um, after being on medications, after going through the treatments, I was still on medications. The treatments helped. They may have saved my life, but um, they didn't fix anything. Ultimately, I was still going through the same cycles, just not as extreme. And I was still on medication and I'd been on um, short-term disability from work a couple of times. And I decided couldn't do this, that I couldn't just go on disability. I had to go back to work and decided to kind of take it into my own hands because I'd seen so many people. I would go to support groups and I would see people who just gave up, um, that they just, you know, decided to go along, work with the system and 
take the medications and the medications, I mean, certainly I'm not saying people shouldn't take them. There are situations when they're definitely needed, but they can be overprescribed too. But ultimately I ended up getting off of every, every one of those medications and, um, and went back to work and that's been eight years now. <laughs> um, but anyway, so during the time that I was recovering from that, I, I, kind of came up with some things on my own that were some that were related to my yoga practices and some that weren't. Um, a lot of it was just getting out and doing some physical activity, which is really important. Um, in fact, uh, you know, if I had someone close to me that was going through what I did, I would make them get up every day. And even if it was just going for a walk twice a day or something just to move. Um, so that was an important part of it too. But, um, also, I was, I was starting to meditate more. I was struggling with that. And I was doing affirmations and visualization practices. One that I would do as I was recovering was as I would go to bed at night, I would just picture people's faces just randomly. And a lot of times it would be people that I would just see in the neighborhood, people that I work with, faces would just random. And I would see them as being happy and smiling for no particular reason. <laughs> and uh, made an effort to uh, sort of enjoy their happiness. And um, so that was a practice I did for a while. But um, as it went on then, I, um, and I, I got away from, as I said, I got away off of all the medications and everything, and I was improving and got back to work. I just continued my yoga practice. And then I was fortunate enough to connect with the local Chennai admission group here and started going to the Vedanta study groups. And that's when, um, and, and I'd done this before, years before, but like I said, it didn't, it didn't sink in as well. I, when I lived in Pennsylvania, I would go to uh, Chennai admission. But um, that was such a great help. And it was like, uh, there was one year that I was going quite intensely, quite a few groups. And um, it had this sort of synergistic effect, I guess, just doing all of these different groups. But it started to sink in even more. And, and that helped me a great deal. But then this past year, with all of the events here and there around the world, um, things gradually, uh, my path and my, and my methods have changed. Because um, as things happened last year, I returned to one of my teachers and it didn't go well. <laughs> and so there was a part of me that um, had an identity invested in that that diminished a bit because of that experience. And then I go back to work first of the year and my position was eliminated. So I had to retire early. 19 years, there was a little bit more of my identity started to diminish. <laughs> and then, whoa, sorry, I lost you there. Um, so then um, COVID came along and uh, I ended up staying indoors more. Actually, I'd started to go teach right after the, the situation with my work. It's like, well, I'll just teach more yoga. And I started doing that and then COVID came along and the yoga studio shut down and I started doing the Zoom class and everything. And I was spending a lot of time alone and I started diving more into um, the direct path. Um, so this is still a Dwight of Vedanta, but um, more of the teachings of uh, Ramana Maharshi and, and uh, Nisargadatta. And um, that has been tremendously helpful. But I think that the other steps maybe prepared me for it. And, and that it helped me to move from what I felt was merely a belief and a support to more of a conviction, more of a, an understanding. And um, so in spite of certain things, I, it's like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> I'm fine. Um, you know, there's still issues of the body. There's, you know, um, all of this going on with COVID. 
but uh, the real me is untouched by any of that. So, um, but anyway, that's just, that's made a big difference for me. So it's like this, this actually, this bit of isolation has actually been beneficial. And I, unfortunately it's been bad for everything else and, and all of the people that have suffered because of it. But um, it has been this natural sort of transition over the course of a year that parts of, parts of my identity, my false identity, the constructed self, <laughs> kind of a phrase I like to use, made up of all these memories and, and, um, and ideas about myself, stories that I would tell myself about myself. And so the interesting thing at this point is just being able to see these things as they come up. And um, it's like um, it's like a different form of sadhana, just watching the thoughts as they come up and the direction they take, and just acknowledging them and letting 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 them pass, letting them dissolve. Yes, you've mentioned some very fundamental uh, methodologies, you know, which is even covered in Patanjali's path. Even, co uh, even covered in the Eightfold Path of Buddhism as well, and also in the teachings of Adi Shankara. Uh, studies, you know, of contemplation, of meditation. And sometimes we always think of study as, uh, yes, there are many different uh, layers of study. It can require textual study. It requires an observation of things as they are. It requires a self-study. You know, what is going on in this internal process? Right. And a lot of um, times we associate, we tend to associate through habitual patterns, through karma. We tend to associate with an emotion, a part of the body, an experience in life. So, you know, the, the, the negative uh, self-critical talk comes in, or maybe you will say, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough, I'm this, I'm that you know, pertaining to either body part uh, as identifying ourselves as a body part, as part of a certain sensation or feeling, pleasant or unpleasant, you know, um, or even some kind of memory, you know, some kind of discriminatory factors so, or compositional factors of memory. So, you know, we keep identifying, uh, would you say there was what you mentioned about the false self, you know, the constructed, Mm -hmm. You know, a very constructed self, which is uh, not entirely um, the ultimate reality of how things are. Right. Okay. So what are some, sometimes even practitioners for 10, 20, 30 years, you know, people who are just beginning in, in the first week, we, we tend to go through some of these patterns, these tendencies. Uh, what are some of the things you would, uh, techniques you have done, you are still doing, which allows you to cut through? To remind yourself, you know, okay, that mind is going in this way, but you are bringing it back single pointed concentration towards a certain mindfulness of whether it's a certain worldview, a certain teaching. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. Yeah, the, the stages you talked about too. So in, in Vedanta, it's, uh, it's uh, Shravana, which is listening to talks by a qualified teacher and and uh, mananam, mulling it over, turning it over in your mind, and then nityasana, or, or the, the meditation, where you take it into your meditation. And um, yeah, so for me now, it's a bit different. Because quite frankly, I, um, for many years, I struggled with the whole mantra, japa uh, practice. And um, it got better for me when I decided that I was putting too many rules around it as far as has to be every day. So I would do periods of time like every day for a month or whatever. And I, I find that practice is, is good for helping to learn to focus and, and it would help me as far as focusing at work. But as far as, and, and that, that's helpful in the relieving stress in itself, but as far as, um, really being able to uh, go beyond that, I think a meditation practices is necessary. That, um, 
and I don't consider japa as meditation. I mean, it may be that it falls off and goes into meditation, but the japa is basically training the mind, just bringing it back, bringing it back, which can be beneficial and can prepare you for other forms of, of meditation that are deeper. For me now, it's almost an automatic just sinking into myself. <laughs> I don't even know how else to describe it. It's, um, and it's, it's not super regimented. In fact, sometimes it's very spontaneous. And um, um, it's this understanding of everything from more of a background perspective and, and witnessing it in, in an objective way, which is, I know is a difficult place to reach. So for meditation though, especially using any kind of visualization techniques. Um, what I was doing before this and what that I, I would always teach in the class would have to do with acknowledging that the sort of default state of everything is inactivity, stillness, and silence. And that's really the substratum of all of this. I mean, everything rises up out of that. It goes back to that. And that that is our true nature as well. And to take that into the meditation, usually using like visualization, using clouds passing as thoughts and the, 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 the clear blue sky as that, that infinite, peaceful stillness, silence, bliss, and, and, and focusing your attention there and just letting, letting the thoughts pass by. So that, that's, what, that's what I used before. But now there's no, there's no real formality around my, my practice. It just sort of happens. Yes, very interesting. So now uh, towards the last segment of the discussion, um, I'd like to steer it towards... Um, some of the tips you could share or suggestions, advice towards um, three situations. So um, I'll just mention and then you can touch on from them. First, towards aspiring seekers. Mm -hmm. Maybe some sharing for them. Some towards, uh, then next will be the yoga, towards people who are yoga uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, people who are experiencing like, immense suffering mental health so mental health survivors mental health uh, you know hmm. yeah so would you oh, like okay. to yeah mention to first to a spiritual seekers uh aspiring yoga teachers or yoga teachers and then mental health survivors sure um spiritual seekers i think it's really a matter of understanding what your um your natural inclination is um some of us are more devotional types. And so a practice like that might be better. I'm biased in that, that I would lean toward Advaita Vedanta for most anything, but I, I know that for some people, um, the concepts are difficult, you know, and maybe even impossible to see, depending on some, some people that I've spoken with, that their, their, their view um, so for spiritual seekers, I would say that, you know, see what it is, what you're, if, how, how it is that you see God and, and take it from there, take that approach that if it's, if it's that you see God is separate from you and, and, um, Billy's, uh, inclinations toward devotional, you may want to look into more of a bhakti type of path. Um, if you're more inclined toward self-discipline, then, then specifically meditation. Uh, but you may want to explore that because there are so many different approaches to that. And then um, for yoga teachers, um, I w <laughs> from what I've seen, and I, I, I've been trying to be more open-minded <laughs> because, uh, um, you know, I, I want, I have no problem with a fully physical practice. That's, that's, that's fine. People who want to pursue that, 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 that makes sense. This body is, uh, is the vehicle for liberation. So 
I would say that, yes, any kind of a physical practice is good because it's good for the body. But I would, I would suggest to yoga teachers to explore more, uh, especially things that fall under the heading of yoga that don't typically fall into your teacher trainings, you know, outside of Patanjali, outside of yoga asanas, outside of Hatha yoga, Pradipika and texts like that. Look, look at, at the Upanishads and look at the yoga that's described there. And that would, that's my, my suggestion. And explore Vedanta. And, but that would be the suggestion there. Um, and also for yoga teachers or aspiring yoga teachers, I would say find what works for you because there are so many different approaches to yoga now and see what works for you. And again, I would be more biased toward the traditional approaches, but um, mental health. Um, it depends on the situation, of course, but obviously anyone who... Uh, who needs to be on medication should be on medication. And sometimes it's, it's a band aid. Sometimes it's just a temporary thing. Some, maybe sometimes it isn't, but um, you know, if, if that's the case, I would never tell anyone that they should just stop taking theirs. Uh, when I did this, I did it under the guidance of a physician at the same time. So I tapered off, but um, as far as mental health goes, the more that you can take care of your body, and your mind, the better off you're going to be. We don't make enough time for ourselves. And I think that that's the biggest part of the problem um, is, is making time for yourself to be able to sit quietly with yourself, with your mind and um, to meditate. And I know that's difficult. I've been in that situation where my mind has been racing and that's where practices like Japa do come in handy. I think even with, you know, with, with the mental health situation, and I know it's a struggle, but it has to be done without judging yourself. And I think that's one of the most difficult parts, but even if it's just a few minutes, you know, I, I think five minutes of being able to sit still peacefully breathing quietly and just reflecting inwardly is probably better than an hour of struggling, wrestling with your mind. So even if you just spend a few minutes. Yes, very invaluable wisdom you have shared with us, especially, you know, this last segment where we have just integrated, uh, you know, some of the suggestions which people can use, you know, considering you have had 40, 50 years of exposure and experience, practical experience with various traditions and practices. So, you know, for viewers who are watching, um, whether you are interested in some form of spirituality, whether it's um, you're interested in some aspect of yoga, even if you have been practicing some of this for some years, and whether um, we are struggling with uh, some element of mental health or mental disharmony, you know, to explore some of these practices under the guidance of a, a teacher, if you can, uh, or even through your self-exploration to to read up some books, to watch some lectures online, you know, this whole process of self-discovery. We all have to start somewhere. And there's this a great American Buddhist teacher, Pema Chodron. She mentions, start where you are. So, to so just start where we are. Regardless of the circumstances, we have to begin at some point, at some place, at some period in our evolution. So... Yes, try the physical practices which you've mentioned, whether it's uh, hatha yoga, whether it's running, whether it's callous techniques, whether it's walking. You know, there are some benefits to this, adding, adding the study, contemplation, meditation, with form of physical uh, exercise or routine, diet as well. We didn't touch much about diet, but um, yeah. diet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I? Yes. Could I make a statement? Um, one other thing under mental health, and yes, diet is very important. One other thing under mental health, and um, it's, it's interesting how 
psychology is borrowing a lot from Eastern traditions. And you're seeing that a lot now, a lot of focus on, on, um, on meditation and uh, especially being in the present moment. Uh, but also um, some of these like cognitive behavioral therapy, I do know that when in the periods when I was um, hospitalized, that that was very helpful. And I've seen now, and I'm not really familiar with dialectical behavioral therapy, but I've seen where they have um, one of their concepts is radical acceptance, meaning acceptance of the present moment as it is, which is what I was speaking about earlier, which is, which is really one of the issues that wanting what's now to be something else and that acceptance. And to me, that's a powerful concept. So anyway, those are two other things that would be worth anyone struggling with mental health issues to look into. Yes, definitely. You've mentioned CBT, which is cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy. Uh, there's also MBSR, mindfulness-based stress relief as well. And mm -hmm. a lot of this came from uh, teachings and practices from Eastern traditions. Um, also to speak to someone, you know, to, uh, for professional help, a therapist, a counselor, and see where it goes with that, you know, but uh, at the same time, the physical exercises, uh, the diet, um, it helps also, and also the studies, the, the meditation, and even for a lot, of, uh, a lot of us, we find it very difficult to sit down and meditate, you know, the mind is in all places. So some practices also uh, for single-pointed concentration, uh, it could be even uh, painting mandalas, mm -hmm. right? Painting mandalas mm -hmm. or even um, deities, you know, whatnot. And this also have a symbolic representation on us, you know, the effect of, of color, the effect of the stroke, the effect of the various symbols as well. You know, it, 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 it resonates, you know, with uh, archetypal, on an archetypal level at least. Uh, this sounds like your last episode that I watched. <laughs> interconnected inter <laughs> yes, yes. interwoven so right. yeah there's so many different things you know sometimes we think oh there's only this meditation and it's sitting down and i can't even sit properly and that's it oh, spiritual yoga is like that and i can't do it but we we you know there are so many different things there's they're walking they're, you know the, uh, in, in in thailand they practice uh, walking meditation Mm -hmm. You know, there are various things we can do, various uh, gratitude, affirmation, prayers before a meal, before sleep. So is this oh, absolutely. Thing. Is this little things. And then when we slowly integrate them, it adds into our lifestyle, integrated, and we might feel more peaceful, more blissful. And I wouldn't say if, uh, you know, and Ram has illustrated today, it's that helped him through um, some of the most gravest challenges he has faced. And not only just lifts you above the water, it allows you to gain your strength and soar into the sky as well. So it's very, uh, you know, very beneficial, a lot of these things. And I hope that this episode, uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, little, this little chunks of wisdom, which, which, which we can all integrate in, uh, into our lives. We can try to explore especially sometimes yoga teachers, as you're mentioning, I don't want to go too much into it, but they can be very stuck into a certain way of doing mm -hmm. things or a certain way of thinking about things. But it's about, you know, realizing that we are students again and we have to explore and it's not just about the body. It's not just about the mind. There has to be a good balance between the both in a very holistic way. So yes, uh, before we, 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 we end today's episode, any, any last words from you, Ram? No, I, I think I've talked quite a bit, so hopefully not too much. So thank you once again for your time, your effort, you know, just your, your energy being here to guide us through a lot of these very difficult topics. You know, we've covered a lot about you being a Westerner, following Hinduism. Um, we've mentioned, we've talked about the initiations you have gone through, the philosophy you now embody with um uh, studying and practicing in a uh, non-dual school of Hinduism, the Advaita Vedanta, and also about your yoga practice, your mental health uh, stories, as well as your spiritual seeking adventures as well. So thank you once again, Ram, for joining us. Thank you. And for 
anyone tuning in at any point, uh, please feel free, to, if, if you do not have time to watch a full video, to snippets, you know, there's various, uh, you know, various um, minerals of wisdom in snippets of, of this video as well you can watch. And please subscribe. Uh, I'll be link, uh, putting the link of my YouTube channel. Subscribe to my page. Uh, share it with your friends, share it with people who might be interested. You know, we speak about a holistic integrative practice um, of, of, of various disciplines on, on this show. So thanks again, Ram, and hope to see you uh, soon. Thanks again for all the viewers as well. And Thank you. And uh, we'll see you again soon. This is episode eight with Yoga Acharya Ram Goodman. Thank you. Thank you.